Welcome to Cornerstone Church. My name is Pastor Jonathan Hall, and I'm so happy that you've joined us today. I'm blessed to be here on staff, and I serve as the kids' ministry director. Our Cornerstone Kids staff makes ministry fun with big games, energetic worship music, and creative Bible teachings. But not to mention our awesome volunteers who make our ministry a place where your kids would want to come back each and every week. We also offer a variety of events throughout the entire year. To learn more about our Cornerstone Kids ministry, visit sacornerstone.org slash kids. If you're watching us online, we are so glad that you have joined us today. I encourage you, let us know where you are watching from in the comments below. And if you have a prayer request, hey, we have a team member ready to pray for you. I'm excited for what God is doing through Cornerstone Church, and I'm glad that you are here with us. Service is about to begin. Good morning, Cornerstone. Would you stand to your feet as we worship the Lord in the house of God today? Those of you who are watching and joining us, welcome to church. Let's sing. Your name is great. We're not ashamed to say it. Your name is great. We'll shout it and claim it. Your name is great. to magnify his matchless name with me today. His name is Jesus. We're not ashamed to say it. Sing Jesus. We'll shout it and home. Sing Jesus. No other name above the name of Jesus. Sing Jesus. 
magnify the Lord with me and let us bless his name together. For the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. Greatly to be praised and highly honored is the name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, coming soon in the clouds of heaven for the church triumphant. Give him praise in this house today. Can we pray together? Our most gracious heavenly Father, we welcome the Holy Spirit of God into this sanctuary right now. Let every heart can be supernaturally charged by the presence of the living God. When Jesus is exalted and the Holy Spirit is recognized, miracles will happen. Mountains will be removed. Rivers will be crossed. Concepts will be achieved. Our lives will be liberated to achieve the destiny that God has for us. We receive that today in the authority of Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, praise the Lord. Give the Lord a shout in the house. We welcome those of you who are watching television across America and around the world to Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas. Today, I'm preaching the second sermon in a series of sermons. The sermon today is the power of your potential. You have a supernatural potential that God has for you and for every member of your family. Those of you who are watching by television, you need to hear this message. Because if there was ever a time America need to be energized with hope about we can achieve through the grace of God, it's right now. Congregation, would you please welcome the national and the international radio television ministry as our singers come. Cornerstone Church, welcome to the house of the Lord. Can you put your hands together with us? Let's celebrate this morning. will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the Lord Almighty our God is the lion the lion of Judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every Bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Set the captives free For who can stop the Lord Almighty Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord? Come on, if you believe that, can you sing that out? Sing, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop 
the Lord. Oh, nothing and no one can stop the Lord. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? For who can stop the Lord? So 
kings. Thank you, Jesus, because you are worthy of all of the praise and all of the glory and all of the honor forever and ever and ever. Amen and amen, church. God bless you. You may be seated. Good morning, I'm Zuleika Trevino and I'd like to welcome you and your family to our service today. Before our pastors share the word with you, let's take a look at some of the amazing opportunities happening here at Cornerstone Church. Get ready to be inspired and uplifted. These are some of the events waiting for you. Experience Holy Week like never before, starting today. Sign up for a full week of devotions led by Pastor Matt Hagee from the Land of Israel. Twice each day during the week, you will receive a video devotional that will strengthen your faith. Sign up at jhm.org slash Holy Week. Next Sunday, we are excited to rejoice in the victory we have in Jesus on Resurrection Sunday. Invite friends and family for a powerful worship and gospel message from Pastor John Hagee. Bring your children to the Ark and the Life Center as we have amazing services tailored just for them. Our annual men's basketball league starting on April 1st is just around the corner. Register as a team of three or individually and we will pair you up with a team. Sign up at sacornerstone.org slash men. We will host open gyms on March 25th to get game ready. Join us for a day of precision shooting at our second annual CCS Benefit Shoot. Enjoy a thrilling competition as you take on clay targets across the range. This event is open to all skill levels and all proceeds will directly benefit CCS students. Register today to secure your spot. Thank you for joining us in the house of the Lord today. For more information about any of the events we share today, please visit our website and make sure to follow us on social media. We hope you have a blessed week. Good morning and God bless you. Those of you who are here with us at Cornerstone Church in San Antonio and those of you who are joining and watching us online, from across the nation and around the world this morning. There are all 50 states plus Washington, D.C. and 91 different nations that are joining us. So congregation, would you make those who are in our online audience welcome here this morning. So many things that you got to see that you can be a part of here at Cornerstone Church. I encourage you to find out more by going to our website at sacornerstone.org. One of them is tonight at 6.30. We're going to continue in our evening Bible study and Sunday night experience with the topic, The Road to Resurrection. Last week, why did Jesus have to die? This week, we're going to discuss the significance of his resurrection as we prepare for our celebration service that will be next Sunday morning, 8.30 and 11 o'clock is going to be the times of our Easter services. There will not be any evening service next week. And so if you come to Sunday night next week, we are not raptured, we're just adjourned. And uh, we want to give you the opportunity to celebrate with friends and family over the weekend. And so we'll be hosting services here at 8.30 and 11 o'clock and look forward to seeing you when you have the chance to join us for our victory celebration of the resurrection next Sunday morning. In the month of April, uh, there's two events that I want to make mention of. One is going to be happening in the first of the month, the April the 5th, uh, benefit shoot for Cornerstone Christian Schools. This is a fabulous way to not only show support for Christ-centered education, but have fun at the same time. It involves the three G's of the gospel, God, grace, and gunpowder. And uh, so we're going to have at the National Shooting Complex on April the 5th, a fundraiser. You can be a part of a team or you can sponsor a team and all proceeds will go to support the students of Cornerstone Christian Schools. At the end of the month, Hagee Ministries and Cornerstone Church is hosting our Come Alive uh, conference. And this year's theme is Take America Back. How many of you know that it's time that righteousness takes this nation back? April the 26th, the 27th, and the 28th are the dates. Uh, Pastor Hagee and I will be among the speakers. Dr. Darius Daniels is going to be here. He's not yet been to Cornerstone Church, but if you have not heard him, you need to hear this man of God. He has an anointing, and he's got a brilliant mind, 
and I know that he's going to share a powerful word with us. Kelly Shackelford from First Liberty is going to be here. Kelly Shackelford is an attorney who diligently works to represent faith-based and First Amendment rights all across the nation. Uh, for example, the case that we were talking about in Indiana where the parents are having to fight to get their child back. Uh, the case of Coach Kennedy up in Washington where a high school football coach had to fight so that he could kneel and pray and be a part of his religious beliefs uh, was something that Kelly also worked on. His wisdom about the situations that we are facing as the body of Christ in the United States today are invaluable. So I'd love for you to come and hear him. I certainly can't say enough about Pastor Hagee. He's going to have a lot to share at uh, Come Alive. Aren't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and then throughout the entire weekend, Miss Britt Nicole is not only going to lead worship with our worship team Friday and Saturday, but she's also going to have a wonderful concert uh, for us on Sunday night. So write those dates down, April 26th, 27th, and 28th, and be a part of that conference. Now, the reason I start mentioning it now is I always run into people after the event is over. And you know what they tell me? We didn't know. Oh, we would have loved to hear Britt Nicole. Oh, we would have loved to see Darius Daniels. Well, guess what, folks? Now you know. So write it down and be here for Come Alive, April 26, 27, and 28. We look forward to seeing you then. Pastor, uh, this is the Sunday that we call Palm Sunday. Yes. And while there's a lot of debate about the date of Jesus' birth, and, and that's not the point of getting into this conversation, there is no debate about the final week of his life. There's no debate about when he came to Jerusalem for the last time. There's no debate about when he was arrested. There's no debate about when he was crucified or when he rose from the dead because it was during Passover and it was during the time that is celebrated on an annual basis. This is the time that we recall Jesus' last visit to Jerusalem, but it won't be his final visit. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday was the fulfillment of a Bible prophecy that is the most shocking prophecy in the Bible for its accuracy. I'll reduce 30 minutes into two. On March the 5th, 444 B.C., that's before the birth of Christ, when the Persian king Artaxerxes issued a decree allowing the Jewish people to go back to Israel and rebuild Jerusalem. This is in Nehemiah chapter 2. The prophecy was that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem 173,880 days later. Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday exactly on that day. Bible prophecy to the pinpoint prophecy. God's word is true. Amen. That's our history, but here's our future. Another Bible prophecy brings Jesus back to Jerusalem riding a white horse followed by the angels and the triumphant church as he comes back to the earth to establish his kingdom on the earth. He will first annihilate the armies that have gathered at Armageddon attacking Israel. He is literally going to kill them all. Get a picture of that and then put his foot on the Mount of Olives, it will split in half and he will declare himself to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to rule this earth for a thousand years. And it's this declaration that we have been commissioned to share with the nation and the nations of the world and every generation until he comes. And the way that we accomplish this mission is by the receiving of tithes and offerings. I'm going to ask our ushers to come and take their positions to help us worship the Lord with giving today. And those of you who are watching and joining us, you too can participate simply by going online to sacornerstone.org forward slash give, or you can take your smartphone 
and text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 210-880-2300. Call us at 855-694-9653 or write to us at P.O. Box 34930, San Antonio, Texas, 78265. Pastor, would you pray for today's offering? Can we lift our hands to the throne of grace? Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, look from the balconies of heaven as we gather in the house of God to celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Today we gather in this place to exalt his name, to proclaim his message, and to bring salvation to the lost of the world, to bring healing for broken hearts, to bring hope for those who have given up hope because Christ is the answer for our nation and for our world. Let that message go forth from this place today. In Jesus' name, amen.
beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. The power of the gospel released under the anointing of the Holy Spirit can change the world can change America and can change your destiny. Romans 13, one says, all power comes from God. Say that with me, all power comes from God. We are soldiers in the army of the living God. We have the power of the word, the power of the blood, the power of his name, arise and do exploits. The greatest need of the church in America today is the preaching of the word of God on the anointing of the Holy Spirit What's in this book? We are at war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Compromise is treason in the courts of heaven. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to wake up, to speak up, to stand up, and fight the good fight, and fight the good fight, and fight to win, and fight now. Will you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Turn with us to Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, as we talk today about the power of your potential. We continue this sermon series, You Shall Receive Power, with this series. We started talking about the power of the Holy Spirit last week. He will lead you into all things. Now today we're talking about the power of your potential, and next Sunday, the power of the resurrection. For today, what is your potential? How do you measure your potential, how to live an abundant and successful life according to the Word of God. Are you destroying your, pen, uh, your potential to discover today how to reach that potential and live your life without limitation? Read with me Matthew 17 and 20. So Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. One of the most powerful verses in all of the Word of God. Say that last line with me, and nothing shall be impossible to you. When you really believe that, your life will explode with unlimited potential. Father, today let the anointing of the Holy Spirit inspire us to be all you destined for us to become because we live life your way. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's children said amen. amen. You may be seated. What is the power of your potential? Power is exciting. Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people attended the Super Bowl. They paid $9,800 per ticket to see two of the most powerful football teams in the NFL slug it out for the Lombardi Trophy. The Kansas City Chiefs won because they had a quarterback that had the potential to run, and they won. People in Texas go to the rodeo to see cowboys ride the most powerful Bramer Bulls in the state. That eight seconds, you see thousands of intelligent people standing on their feet, screaming their heads off, throwing their Stetsons in the air, wondering, is this boy going to be able to ride this bull or is this bull going to stomp him into the ground? It's eight seconds of absolute power on parade, and no one knows who the winner is until the clock says so. The ministry of Jesus was a parade of power. When Jesus came to the earth, the masses followed him, not to hear his teaching. There were plenty of rabbinical teachers, but they wanted to see the demonstration of his power because the world had never seen that. Jesus stopped a funeral procession and raised the widow's son back to life. He raised Lazarus from the dead after he had been in his grave for three days saying, Lazarus, come forth. 
Why did he call the name Lazarus? Because if he hadn't said Lazarus, every dead person on the planet would have risen out of their grave because he is the resurrection and the life. He commanded the lame to take up their bed and walk after being decades at the pool of Bethesda. He turned water into wine at the wedding of his friends. There was enough wine left over as a dowry to the newlyweds. Actually, they were rich because of what he left them. When Christ comes into your life, he brings blessing and wealth and power. During the raging storm on the seas of Galilee, he defied the laws of gravity, walked on water to the terrified disciples, shouting into the teeth of the storm, peace, be still. Listen, the thing that was about to destroy them, he used for a sidewalk to save them. The thing that you think is about to destroy you, God is going to use it as a sidewalk to bless you with unlimited blessing. Give the Lord praise in the house. And this is something they had never seen. Jesus cast out demons with a word. He didn't interview demons. He cast them out with a word. They had never seen that. He crushed the powers of sin and Satan at the old rugged cross when he took my sin and your sin and gave us forgiveness. He took our sickness and gave us divine health. He took our rejection and gave us peace. We were outside the covenants of Israel and he adopted us and made us royalty. You are sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The royal blood of heaven is flowing in your veins. You are somebody. Act like it in Jesus' name. He walked out of his grave on the third day just like he said he would. And I'll tell you next Sunday more about that. He's coming back again in power and great glory in the clouds of heaven to rapture the church. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. Our God is an awesome God. Oh, what a wonderful Savior whose power has no limit. Ephesians 6, 11 says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You have access to that power. Use it in Jesus' name. Give the Lord praise. What is your potential? What is your potential? There's enough atomic energy in a glass of water, science is saying, to drive a battleship around the world four times. But the question is, how do you release the potential in that glass of water. According to UCLA's Brain Research Institute, the human brain has the potential to create, store, and learn virtually without limit. Their research concludes that we could, without any difficulty whatsoever, learn 40 languages, memorize a set of of encyclopedias from A to Z, That's your mental potential. And I believe at one time it was. Adam in the Garden of Eden had a supernatural knowledge because he was the general manager of the universe. But when he fell because of sin, I think God limited that capacity back to where we are. Listen to this. The English language has over 450,000 words. Linguistic experts estimate that our daily conversations are made up of about 400 words. And the majority of those words are me, my, mine, and I. And why? (laughs) Why? Why was Matthew's favorite word as a child? (laughs) Come inside. Why? Shut off the television. Why? We're going to bed. Why? Why? Because I said so. (laughs) 
Why? Because the only way to obtain knowledge is through study. St. Paul said, study to show yourself approved. Say that with me. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Study the word of God. Let it come into your life. David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. Hidden in his heart, I mean, he memorized it. When you really get in a crisis, you don't have time to run home to your library and break out your tape series on faith. You need to have it ready to go. Knowledge is power. Say that with me. Knowledge is power. And the first principle is releasing the potential is to gain the knowledge that's in this book. I hold in my hand the most awesome manuscript God ever allowed men to hold in their hand. It is the revelation of God's power to use. You should speak it. You should pray it. You should think it. You should live by it. And you will know the unsearchable riches of God to explode in your life. Give the Lord praise in the house. Read this book and your life will explode with prosperity, passion, power, and divine purpose. This is a two-edged sword for spiritual warfare. This is the bread of life that satisfies the hungry. This is the living water to those who thirst. This is greater than Jack Daniels. How do I know about that? Because I've seen it in your house. This message will heal the sick. It will heal your sick marriage. Husband, it says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. That means you're willing to die for your wife. I didn't hear too many masculines amen there. Okay, ladies, and the Bible says, wives, submit yourself to your own husband. Stop getting your advice for some brainless television talk show where these godless secular humanists whose only love is self-adoration try to advise you about how to live your life. This is the compass that you need for your life, for your marriage, for your destiny. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. David said, thy word is truth. Say that with me. Thy word is truth. Amen and amen. This book has the answer for every crisis that you are facing or ever will face. I'd rather have one page out of this book than to have every book in the Harvard Library. This book will bring America back to the moral, from the moral and spiritual crisis in which we find ourselves. And let me tell you this, if America does not have a spiritual awakening, we're going to lose this country. In God we trust is on our coins, but we better get that in our churches, in our families, in our schools, if we're going to save ourselves as a nation. It's impossible for American society to function with boys becoming girls and girls becoming boys. That's witchcraft. It ought to be stopped and stopped immediately. Thirteen-year-olds are having babies. Fifteen-year-olds are killing each other and shooting policemen in the streets. They go to jail and they're out in 30 minutes. 17-year-olds are dying by the thousands from fentanyl drugs. Think about that. 100,000 young people murdered by a product made in China, sent to Mexico, that comes into America through our southern border. We need as a nation to get a president who will shut that border down. This is an educational fact. 
18-year-olds are getting high school diplomas that can't read to the third grade level. Our public schools are the laughing stock of the world. The answer is give the parents the right to choose for their children where their tax dollars should follow that child and watch the schools improve. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people mourn. America is in a state of mourning. We are in a state of mourning. What we need is a spiritual awakening, a return to righteousness. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Give the Lord praise in the house. Are you tormented by your past? Out of these pages pours a fountain filled with blood. One drop of that blood can remove your past instantly and make you whiter than snow. Your past is buried in the deepest sea, never to be remembered against you anymore. That's enough to make a Baptist shout. (laughs) God Almighty is your father. Heaven is your home. You are a child of the king, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Get that. Nothing shall be impossible to you. What is your potential? An Indian, an American Indian tells about a brave who found an eagle's egg and put it in the nest of a prairie chicken. And the eaglet hatched with a brood of chicks and grew up with him. All his life, the eagle, thinking that he was a prairie chicken, did what the prairie chickens did. He scratched in the dirt for seeds, for insects to eat. He clucked and cackled. He flew only briefly because that's only what he had seen others do. After all, that's how prairie chickens were supposed to fly, just a very short distance. Years passed, and the earthbound eagle grew into full maturity. One day he saw a magnificent bird flying in the heavens absolutely effortlessly, flying with a graceful majesty of power on the currents of the wind. It soared with scarcely a beat of its powerful wings. And he said to the other uh, the other chicks around him, what a beautiful bird. That bird, uh, and, and the chicken said, That bird is an eagle, but don't you ever think that you can ever be like him? So the eagle, never giving it another thought, died scratching in the dirt for worms when he had the ability to fly in the highest heavens because he denied his potential based on his environment and what he was around. The greatest tragedy in life is not death, but life that fails to reach its divine purpose. Think about that. You're scratching in the dirt when you could be flying on the wings of faith into the face of God and no joy unspeakable and peace that surpasses understanding. I want to give you five rules of a great life. I want you to listen very closely. One, Make peace with your past so you won't destroy your future. Don't be pushed by your problems. Be led by your dreams. Secondly, the only person in charge of your happiness is you. The Bible says, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Say it. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How much you don't know what's going on in my life. Grow up! Live in this book. Thirdly, what other people think about you is none of your business. Who cares what they think about you? Who cares? There's a Bible verse that's always been a comfort for me. It says, beware when all men speak well of you. 
That has blessed me for many, many years. <laughs> Virtually every decision you make, there's a committee of doubters filled anointed of God to come and spread that doubt through your mind. When God gives you the commission, stay focused and get there. Don't compare your life before. Don't compare your life with others. Comparison is the theft of joy. St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, those who compare themselves by themselves are not wise. Paul is being very kind. Those who compare themselves by themselves are simply stupid. <laughs> Why? Because we were all created in the image of God with a divine purpose. We're not all equal. Some of you, God bless you, are beautiful people. You could wear a toe sack and look good. And then some of us didn't make that cut. We just have to work at it. God bless us all. Smile. Embr five, smile and embrace joy. You don't own all the problems in the world. The Bible says, casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. Why are you carrying all those emotional burdens? Throw them on him. Cast it on the Lord. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Believe that you can and you will, but you must have faith in God to practice the principles of truth in this book. There's a difference between having a great living and having a great life. Some of you in this room and many of you watching by television, you have a great living, but you have a tormented life. You don't have peace. You don't have joy. You have no hope for the future. Life, you're living a life without love, an endless treadmill of suffering. There's a difference between having a great living and having a great life. When Elvis Presley was at the peak of his career, his manager, Colonel Parker, arranged for me to meet and talk with him in his hotel room here in San Antonio. Elvis had everything that a man could possibly want. He had luxury cars. He had jets. He had diamonds. He had fame. He had the applause of millions of people. His telephone was covered with gold. Yet when I spoke with him, I've never met a more lonely person. He was a good person. The world loved his music. Well, maybe some Pentecostals didn't, but <laughs> the world loved his music. He had a great living. And when we finished our conversation, he took my hands and said, Pastor, would you pray with me? And I assure you, God heard our prayers. He had a hurting heart and a lonely life. What kind of life do you have? Are you lonely? You feel without purpose? You're frustrated? You're chasing illusions that never materialize? Your home is in crisis. Your marriage is a war zone. Your business is falling apart. Depression follows you like a black dog. Hear me. You're not living up to your potential. God has made it possible for you to have peace that surpasses understanding, joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, to have unconditional love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that includes you. And if God loves you, quit whining about the people who don't love you. That's enough. God made it possible for you to have financial abundance. 3 John 1 and 2, beloved, I wish above all things, this is God the Holy Spirit writing, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. The secret in Luke in 6.38 says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and running over. You give first and then you receive. You give first and then you receive. You have to plant the seed before you get the harvest. And as many plants as you want, it depends on the seed you sow. You can have joy that knows no limit. In his presence is the fullness of joy. Joy comes in the morning. So much joy you hurt yourself getting up out of bed. 
For some of you, that's a miracle. God's joy is greater than the trial you're going through. God's presence is greater than the, than the people that are, are disturbing you. God Almighty will give you confidence in a world that's coming apart. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, said with me, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. If God is with you, live it up. Be happy, filled with joy, overcome, reach your potential. Then comes Jesus of Nazareth saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you even to the ends of the earth. Your mother or your father may forsake you, but I will not forsake you. I will walk through the water and the water won't drown you. You can walk through the fire and the fire won't burn you. You are mine and hell cannot touch you. You know, man can take you out of my hand because you are my child and you will accomplish your destiny. If you keep your eyes on me, if you listen to me, then we will fulfill your destiny together. It will happen. Give the Lord praise in the house. Your potential is not what you've done. What you have done is your history. Your yesterdays are not nearly as important as today and your tomorrows. Some of you are destroying your potential by living in the glow of some shiny moment in your past. It possesses your thought, your speech. It paralyzes your action for today. If you're a salesman, if you broke all records selling last year, forget it. Forget it as quickly as you can because you can flat starve to death remembering how wonderful you used to be. Did your business have its finest year last year? Forget it. Student, did you make the honor roll last year? Forget it. What you made last semester doesn't affect this semester. If you made the all-star team, forget it as quickly as you can. This is a new year. It's a new beginning. It's over. You can starve to death and go broke remembering how great you used to be. Your potential is the business you can do but haven't done. Your business is the grades you can make but you haven't made. Your prosperity is the dream you dream about that hasn't happened. The promotions that you are capable of getting, you haven't gotten. The souls you can win but you haven't won to Jesus Christ. A college student took an aptitude test and the professor said, based on these test scores, we find that your greatest potential will be realized in a company that's owned by your father. <laughs> Think about it. I'm weary of hearing God's children say, I don't have much potential. What I see is that eagle scratching around in the dirt, cackling with prairie chickens. Little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. Every seed has the potential of a forest. Every fish has the future of a school of fish. Every bird can produce a flock of birds. Every, in every cow, there is a herd. In every man, there is a nation. Abraham birthed a nation. Bethlehem's manger was not the Marriott, but what happened in Bethlehem's manger shook the world. It shook the world. The stone that killed Goliath was small, but it changed the destiny of the world. God said to Abraham, I will make of you a mighty nation. In God's calculation, one equals many, little equals much, small equals great, less equals more. The fact that you were born is proof that God put you on this earth with the potential to accomplish something that no one else has. You should fulfill that destiny. <laughs> Learn to release the power of God. Reach for greatness. Dare to fly on the wings of faith when the cowards around you are scratching for bugs in the dirt. 
They that wait upon the Lord, said with me, shall renew their strength. They shall mount on wings as eagles and live their life without limit. Do it in the name of Jesus. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible to you. Give the Lord praise in the house. Your source determines your potential. When God finds something, when God creates something, he finds a special substance. Call it the source. And he creates that something. As long as that created something stays in contact with its source, it has life and unlimited power. When God wanted to create plants, he selected dirt as the source. As long as plants stay in contact with dirt, they live, they flourish, they, they rise to their potential. Take that plant out of dirt and it dies. Fish has a source. It's water. Take a fish out of water, it will die. Stars have great potential. Inside the core of a star is nothing but helium gas. That's a fact. It's hydrogen atoms smashing together to form helium. And stars are nothing but a ball of gas. Remember that the next time somebody calls you a star. <laughs> Let's talk about you. When God created you, he created you out of dirt and placed his spirit in your clay temple. You came out of God. God is your source. In Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image. As long as you stay in contact with your source, the life of God can explode through you. Rooted and grounded in God and in his word, you have the power to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You don't have to go to a healing crusade for God to heal somebody. If somebody is sick in your family, you pray for them. You have the power over demon spirits. You have power over the world, the flesh, and the devil. You have the power over powers and principalities in the heavenlies. You have the power of his name. You have the power of his blood. You have the power of his gospel. You have the power as a representative of the kingdom of God. You said every time you pray the Lord's prayer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Give him praise in the house. Consider your potential in God. He has given us dominion over the earth. He has made us to be kings and priests. Get a hold of that. You are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells in you to show you things to come. And Paul said the things to come are so overwhelming the half has not entered into the minds of men what God has prepared for his own. You are created a little lower than the angels. Angels go before you and behind you. The Bible says he will give his angels charge over you. Every believer has the right to believe that he has at least two angels. He will give his angels charge over you to protect you in all of your way. I think I've probably worn out my two angels. They're asking for relief. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is your father. No limitation is yours. God is the glory. As a Bible-believing Christian, you are awed by the standards of the world. You feel supreme love for someone you've never seen. That would be Jesus Christ. You talk to a God you can't touch. You empty yourself in order to be full. You decrease that he may increase. You go down in order to get up. You are strongest when you are weakest. You are rich when in fact you are poor. You die so that you can live forever. You give away so that you can keep forever. You see the invisible 
You hear the inaudible. You know the unknowable because you are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Glory, glory, glory. Brother, it's enough to make a Presbyterian shout. Listen closely. A plant must stay in contact with dirt to live. A fish must stay in contact with water to live. Just so you must stay in contact with God and his word or you will spiritually die. You will spiritually die. How much spiritual nutrition do you get out of this book on a daily basis? Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. You're the, the message is stay in touch. Stay in touch with me or you will die. The Bible says without me, you can do nothing. Say that with me. Without me, you can do nothing. Through Christ, I can do all things. But without Christ, I don't have enough power to frighten a used demon. Your potential is activated by faith. God said, let us make man in our image. The Hebrew meaning of the word likeness here is to operate like, not look like. Now, this is new for some of you, for most of you. The Hebrew meaning of likeness here means to operate like, not to look like. How does God operate? God operates by faith. If you're not functioning like God, you're malfunctioning. All that God is and all that God has is given to us on the wings of faith. The Bible says without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is not an opinion, it's a requirement. Faith is not emotion. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is substance. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith does not demand miracles. Faith creates miracles. Faith starts out before you know how it's going to turn out. Faith does not leap in the darkness. It's a walk in the light. Faith is not hoping God is real. Faith is knowing God is real based on the evidence of Scripture. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. That's what's in this book. There is no reason you cannot succeed now and succeed fabulously well. Fly on the wings of faith and accomplish your divine destiny in God. Give the Lord a shout of praise in the house of God. God created you with the potential to enjoy life at its very best. If you're not, it's not God's will It's because it's your choice not to live by all of the blessings God has given you here. Live your life according to this book, and you'll have a happy, joyous, victorious, prosperous life that the world wishes they could get. But it's only possible to those who confess Christ as Lord and Savior. Can I hear an amen? Would you please stand to your feet? How many of you in this room can say, Pastor, I know I'm not living up to my potential. And from this day forward, I want to forget what other people are thinking about me and saying about me and focus on what you want me to accomplish. Secondly, I have a great living, but I'm not happy. I have little or no peace. Life has little direction. My marriage is in trouble. My children or grandchildren have gone astray. Or I'm allowing the accomplishments of the past to destroy the potential of the present. Or as a plant must stay in contact with the source of life, you have turned loose of God, which is your source. There's unconfessed sin in your life. You sing the songs, but you are joyless because Jesus is not your Lord. Knowing that your potential is released by faith, you want to learn today to live by faith and to be all that God wants you to be. 
If any of those statements reflect you, would you slip your hand up as a confession to God right now that you want to change and start now? Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to embrace your will for my life today. I want to embrace your will for my life today. I want to be able to forget. I want to be able to forget what people are thinking or saying. What people are thinking or and saying. accomplish my divine destiny. Accomplish my divine destiny. I ask you, I ask you to open the windows of heaven. And to, bless and to bless with prosperity, with, prosperity, with peace, peace, with joy, with happiness, happiness that is infectious. Let my life be a reflection, Let my life be a reflection of, the goodness of, God. of the goodness of God. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen. Pastor Matt, let's sing the song. Hallelujah. And now may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may the Lord richly bless you. May you leave this assembly today to, to accomplish the divine purpose that God has given you to reach the potential you have to bless your family, to bless the body of Christ, to bless the world, with a light that glows with the presence of the living God. Receive the peace of Jesus Christ. Reject everything that tries to destroy that peace. Walk in the confidence that you are the property of heaven, that God's angels surround you as you walk, and your destiny is going to be accomplished because God is with you. Receive this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise in the house of God. For this name. Amen. being a part of our services today. I know that you were encouraged as you heard Pastor Hagee share this powerful message on your potential and what the Bible has to say about what happens in your life when you put your faith in God and you begin operating in His promises. I know I was encouraged and today if you need prayer, please take a moment and reach out. Call us the numbers at the bottom of your screen or you can go online to sacornerstone.org or JHM, either one and find ways to connect with us so that we can encourage you this morning. I want you to stay tuned because there's more Sunday content coming your way. 
We're continuing to discuss our Sunday conversation back to the basics and our requirement to grow in our faith. I believe that you'll find this content valuable and it'll be a great part of your weekly Bible study if you want to continue to utilize this resource. Also, remember, Come Alive is going to be taking place April the 24th, 25th, and 26th. Darius Daniels, Kelly Shackelford, Britt Nicole, Pastor Hagee, myself, all part of the speakers and those who are going to be here on our Cornerstone campus. I want you to block those dates out and come be a part of what we're doing. Those of you who wanted to give, you can give today by going online to sacornerstone.org forward slash give, texting the word give, G-I-V-E, to 210-880-2300 or call us at 855-694-9653. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of our services today. We look forward to seeing you here again on our campus at Cornerstone Church. God bless. God. Welcome back to our Sunday conversation. We're still discussing getting back to the basics of the principles of our faith. What does it mean to be a Bible-believing Christian? I think, for example, just that phrase alone requires a little bit of explanation because, you know, if you talk to enough people, you might believe that everyone is a Christian. After all, the United States was once described as a Christian nation. On our money, it says one nation under God. The question is, which God and what exactly does that mean? So whenever we talk about being a Bible-believing Christian, what we're saying is that you are a person who actually considers the Word of God to be the authoritative voice of the Lord provided to us by the Holy Spirit as described in the Bible. Not only do you believe that this is the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God, but you read it, you obey it, and you believe it. So, when we read Hebrews chapter 6, there it says, Leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work and faith toward God, that would be the conversation that we had in the previous two lessons about not only the nature of salvation, but the benefits of salvation. And then he presses on to say, and the doctrine of baptisms. Now, first and foremost, pay close attention to the fact that Paul didn't write in Hebrews chapter 6, baptism, single. He said baptisms, plural. And this word baptizo in the Greek doesn't mean necessarily to just be dipped in water, but it means to live a life that is immersed. And many times when you look in the Bible, there are ways that people were immersed into, for example, the baptism of repentance. That was one immersion. Jesus Christ said that you would be baptized with fire. What does that mean? How would your life be immersed in fire? Was it a fire of judgment? Was it a fire of purification? That there was a baptism of suffering, that there was a baptism in the Holy Spirit. All of these baptisms describe moments in your life that you are immersed in a very real situation. And when you come out, you're different. But let's begin this discussion of baptism, talking about what most people consider the most common baptism, because after all, you'll hear people often discuss, I've been baptized in the church, and state it as if that alone was sufficient for all of the things in their life to be in proper order in not only their earthly life, but in their heavenly relationship with God. So when somebody asks you, have you been baptized? I think it's important for you to understand what the Bible has to say about it. For example, who gets baptized? What is the purpose of a water baptism? When should you be baptized? Where should the baptism take place? Or why do it at all? In the last two lessons, we dealt with what the Word of God has to say about the foundation of salvation. One, the need for it. 
all have sinned. The wages of sin is death. And then the benefits of salvation. So it's a very natural progression to go from the topic of salvation to water baptism. Because if you believe what the Bible says, then you'll understand that this verse here in Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse 15, helps us recognize where the concept of the requirement comes from. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, this is Jesus speaking. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, this is obviously something that's echoed in every one of the gospels and we call it the commission. But then in verse 16, it says, and he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, notice here it says, and he who believes and is, it does not say water baptized. It says, he who believes and is baptizoed. Again, that's the Greek word for baptism that we use as a transliteration. But what it means is an immersion. It means that you are saturating your life in Christ. The qualifications for Mark 16, believe and be baptized, will be saved. That salvation means you go to heaven, but it doesn't necessarily mean you get wet. You've heard Pastor Hagee say, water won't save you. If water could save you, some people need to be staked out in deep water overnight. That's a quote from his sermon that I've heard since I was a child. It's not the function of water baptism. It is the immersion of your life, heart, soul, mind, and body into living for Christ. That's what you are to be baptized in. The water baptism is nothing more than a symbol of your commitment to spend the rest of your life being baptized, immersed in Jesus, in his word, in his presence, in his teachings, in crucifying yourself so that you can live and follow him. Not, I go to church on Sunday and that's my relationship quotient for the week. And then the rest of the week I live for myself, but every breath, every day, I am immersed. I am baptized. I am baptizoed in Christ. Whenever this phrase baptized was used in the New Testament, it was something that everyone understood in the context of immersion because the way that cloth was dyed in the times of the Bible, linen, cotton, they typically came in basically a white or off-white color. So if you were to have a crimson cloak, as the Bible says, Jesus had a seamless garment and it was red. If you were to have a crimson cloak, it was something that was highly valuable. And the only way that you could get it that color is to baptizo, to immerse the cloth that you wanted to have the color into the dye. You didn't dip it, you soaked it. And so what's being described here is that you believe in the gospel and then you begin to soak your life in what the word of God says. You become a Bible believing Christians. This is where we get some of the modern terminology, practice what you preach. It's to say in another way, actions always speak louder than words. You know, whenever you start to live for something, it's obvious to all that you are fully committed. I often tell people, I say, you don't have to tell me what you care about. I just get to watch and I'll know. People care about their lawn. You know how you know? It's highly manicured. People care about their golf game. You know how I know? 
even when they're not on the golf course, they're practicing their swing in the mirror or they're replaying the round in their head or they're talking about it in conversation. People care about all kinds of silly things if you really want to think about it, but if you're honest, you don't have to ask them what they care about. All you have to do is watch them and you know. When you live a life immersed in Christ, people care and understand what you care about because they see the fruit of your life. The Bible says a tree is known by its fruit. It's not known by its leaves. It's not known by the size of its trunk or its branches or the height or the width. It's known by its fruit. I know that some of the sweetest tasting fruit that I enjoy comes off of a peach tree. I love Fredericksburg peaches here in the Texas Hill Country every spring. But I promise you this, nobody has ever walked by a peach tree and said, what a majestic tree. They appreciate the fruit, but the appearance of it's not all that much, not compared to an oak or a sequoia. So when people look at your life, they can tell by the fruit of your life whether or not you have immersed your spirit, your heart, your soul, your mind, your body into the word of Jesus Christ. This is the water of the word. The water that's in the baptismal is important for symbolic reasons, but this is the water that your life is supposed to be baptized in. So let's answer this question. Who gets baptized? Well, if it wasn't important, Jesus wouldn't have done it. Sometimes people hear, well, you're saying, you know, that if we immerse our life in Christ, that we don't have to get water baptized. I believe what the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What did Jesus do? Jesus went down to the Jordan River and he was baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist told Jesus, you shouldn't be baptized by me. I should be baptized by you. And Jesus told John the Baptist, I'm doing this in keeping with all righteousness. Jesus said to John, I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. So if Jesus thought it was the right thing to do, you and I should consider it the same. It's the right thing to do. I find it kind of silly when people want to argue about doing the right thing. Well, I'm not going to be baptized. Well, that's your choice. But if Jesus did it and you follow Jesus, how can you say that you're willing to do whatever he's done and you want to argue about something as simple as water baptism? When John was baptizing in the Jordan River, according to Jewish tradition, you had to be baptized in moving water, living water, so that it would wash away your sins. Jesus Christ in John's gospel, chapter 7, verse 38, he says of the Holy Spirit that whoever thirsted and came to Jesus, he would give them a drink and they would never thirst again because out of them would flow living water. It would be a source that was constantly being refreshed. What he was saying is, if you immerse your life in me, I will always refresh you. The Spirit of God will bring you the promises of God. We talked about the benefits of salvation. It's the Holy Spirit that reminds you of your benefits. The Holy Spirit in many ways is kind of your concierge in heavenly places. He's reminding you, you have the permission of God's word to do this. When Christ spoke of the living water in John chapter seven, it was a foreshadowing of the ultimate purpose that he served here on earth to usher in the power of his Holy Spirit into the lives of those who were believers so that they could live their life immersed in his promises, immersed in his power, baptized. Why does Hebrews chapter six talk about baptisms? Because this is more than just water. I really want to take a moment and if you would, imagine with me a river of water, the Jordan River, and there's John the Baptist described as a wild man with a long beard and an unkept, a man of the wilderness. And here comes Jesus, the sinless son of God. And he walks into water that 
symbolically has been washing the sins of mankind off all day long. It's not clean water. If you've ever been to the Jordan River or you've ever seen it, it's not the most pleasant sight. It's significant from a biblical perspective, but in terms of geography, it's not much to look at. It's kind of a muddy creek. So here comes Jesus walking into the symbolic place where sins have been washed all day long, and he is sinless. He's perfect, but he's walking into imperfection. He's pure, and he's walking into absolute impurity. He's righteous, walking into a pool of unrighteousness. It is a perfect picture of the purpose of the Son of God. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might be the righteousness of God. There's Jesus, perfect in every way, standing in a place where men have come to wash the filth off of their life. That's still what he does today. And here in this passage of Scripture, we see a very vivid demonstration of the Trinity. We have the sinless Son of God standing in the unrighteousness of men. Then the Bible says a voice from heaven was audibly heard. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Bible says a dove descended above him and it was the Holy Spirit. Why did all of this happen? So that not only those who were there watching that baptism that day were clear about who was in that water, but that you and I, when we read this passage of scripture, even now recognize who was in that water. That's Jesus, the son of the living God. That's Jesus, the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter three. That's Jesus, the word made flesh and dwelt among us in John chapter one and verse 14. That's Jesus, the one who was and is and is to come. Now, this is a teaching. I'm not going to start preaching, but trust me, I can get excited about the conversation that we're having that that was Jesus. It was so that no one could say that Christ was baptized, not only because he was sinful, he wasn't sinful. That's why God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But it was also so that no one would be able to deny that this was no ordinary man standing in that water. And if he was baptized, it's important for us to be baptized. The word of God teaches us that Christ is our example. Not only was he an example in baptism, he was an example in prayer. He was an example in fasting. He was an example in giving. He was an example in kindness. One of the most important verses to the New Testament church is be kind one to another forgiving one another, just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. It was the kindness and the willingness of Christ to forgive us that is our example in how we should treat and forgive others. When your life is baptized, immersed in the word of God, you'll find the power from the Holy Spirit that you need to live your life as a child of God so that just like God on the day of Jesus' baptism said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When you stand before him as a redeemed child of God and heir and joint heir brought near by the blood of Jesus, you'll also get to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in to thy rest. Thank you for joining us for this Sunday conversation. We're gonna continue discussing the baptism that the Bible speaks of, not just who gets baptized, but why do you get baptized, when and where, and for what reason. I hope you'll join us next week as we continue to discuss the very Bible basics that build our faith each and every day.
Sometimes we get so caught up in the busyness of the day-to-day -day that we forget to do the simple things in life, such as exchanging a friendly greeting with our neighbors. It is time to be God's love in action, like the Good Samaritan. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. Does your life reflect His truth? We are called to be salt and light. Our actions and lifestyles need to reflect the light of Jesus to those around us. We are a living testimony of God's goodness. If we are not shining God's love on those around us, then who will they turn to? This month, with a special gift of any amount to the ministry, we'll send you a special Not By Bread Alone salt box. For your generous gift of $250 or more, we'll also send you a signed copy of Diana Hagee's commemorative cookbook, Not By Bread Alone, accompanied by an apron, cookbook stand, dish towel, and salt box. This set makes a special gift for a loved one. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. Call the number on the screen or go to jhm.org bread. Hi, I'm Kendall Hagee. Thank you for connecting with us today. God bless you, and we pray that you'll join us again next week.